I'm Peter Block at TCT 2019 in San Francisco for ACC.org. On my left is Tony DeMary, an old friend from San Diego. Tony and I have done these wrap-ups in the past, and Tony, welcome. Uh, it is day two, the end of day two. We have some important clinical trials that came uh, out today, most interesting perhaps, or as interesting as others, two new valves, the portico valve uh, and the accurate neo. So let's talk about portico first off. What are your thoughts on that one? Sure thing. Well, portico is a repositional valve, and that would be an advantage clearly. And, and the portico tower trial compared it to uh, a, a sa sapien valve uh, that wasn't exactly their latest uh, addition, but it compared very favorably. And in fact, it was uh, one of those non inferiority <laughs> studies, Peter. Go. So. Yeah. So uh, that clearly that has some implications, but nevertheless, it was non-inferior to the Sapien. And uh, they did a, an interesting analysis in, in terms of after a learning curve, where really the, uh, the data were superimposable. So suggesting that uh, if there were equivalent experience with the portico as with the sapien, that they would be identical. Yeah, it's a new valve. Everybody has to learn something when they put a new valve in for the first few times. But once that's done, the learning curve seemed relatively short and seemed to be OK. So the portico makes non-inferiority no problem at all. The Accurate Neo, a little bit of a different story. Yeah, Accurate Neo uh, didn't make it. There were uh, a number of, of problems, primarily uh, uh, prosthetic valve uh, leakage and regurgitation. And so that, that did not prove to be uh, equivalent. And uh, who knows what will become of the accurate NEO, but in the scope trial, it, it just didn't compare favorably. Yeah, we forgot to mention in the Portico trial, they have a new iteration called the FLEX, which is a delivery system. And I don't know the details of that, but it seems as though that FLEX will allow them to get around the transverse arch a little bit better. And it seemed as though the outcomes using that system were really better than the original Portico. So. Uh, well, it's a moving target, as all new devices are, but promising for the portico and sort of disappointing for the accurate NEO. Right, and it's anticipated that there will be more uh, TAVR valves uh, as, as time goes by, as the technology gets better and better and better, and it's exciting to see that development. Yeah, yeah. we need some new valves to, to put on the shelf in any case, right? Right. Okay, so that number one. So now we have partner three, a substudy. This is an interesting substudy. This is a CT substudy of partner three where they <clears throat> wanted to see uh, how much of this subclinical valve thrombosis business there really did uh, occur, how much of it occurred and how important was it. Your thoughts on that one, Tony? They did a CT study and with HALT. H-A-L-T, I'll let you explain it. Right, hypo-attenuated leaflet thickening. Uh, uh, presumably thrombi that form on the leaflets, both TAVR and SAVR. And they compared the two valves, which were more or less similar. This was a CT study. Right. They looked at uh, outcome at the end of a year, which was, was kind of interesting. And the data were a bit complex in that some people who didn't have HALT at three months had it at one year. Some people who didn't have it developed, who had it, lost it and whatnot. But the bottom line, Peter, was that at the end of a year, the clinical events really were no different than those patients who had HALT and those patients who didn't. So one of the things that are interesting about this study was that there are some patients who had you know, the leaf that thickening at uh, two months and then three months later it disappeared and it was sort of unclear how all that happened. And also you talked a little bit, or should talk a little bit about the anticoagulation. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it, clearly uh, it would appear that the anticoagulation was not always effective in these patients. And, and it, it's been the hope in the past that just uh, uh, giving anticoagulation to the whole patients should uh, 
result in resolution. Yeah, but you know, if you had thrombosis on your valve, you'd probably want anticoagulation, but it didn't seem to make an awful lot of difference in this. It's a funny trial, funny data, but the short version is it doesn't seem clinically to make much difference. It doesn't seem to make yeah. much difference, so that we've been very concerned about it. It's probably been happening with surgical valves for years and years. Yeah. No one did CTs, nobody But now it's documented knew. in the surgical valves. Now yeah. it's documented. So lastly, we have the mitral valve and valve study. This is a registry, Tony, not a randomized trial of patients who had had previous mitral valve surgery, mostly rings, I would guess, and now are having a transcatheter valve. Uh, your thoughts on this one. This was compared to SDS scores, sort of a funny way of comparing it to surgery. Was not a randomized control trial, but nevertheless was very encouraging. They were able to do valve and valve in the vast majority of, of patients, low incidence of adverse effects, good hemodynamic performance, and good clinical results at the end of the year. So that's all very encouraging. The fact that those patients did better than would have been anticipated by their STS score is kind of uh, icing on the cake, but the real test will be uh, putting them up against uh, a surgical redo cohort. Surgical redo cohorts in patients who are who have failed a mitral surgery in the past or is not a great operation. Tough, tough sledding, yeah. no question about yeah, it. Yeah, I'll bet on the, um, uh, the transcatheter valve on that one. Yeah, I, I would say based on, based on those data at this point in time, if I needed uh, a redo mitral valve, I'd, I'd go the valve and valve route. So there you have it. That's day two.